Alrighty, everybody. The first thing we're going to do this afternoon is review what we did last time. So, please take out your notebooks, keep them on your desk, but don't open them yet. We're going to see what you guys remember from last week. Alrighty, so, first of all, who can tell me what is the water cycle? Very good. So that's what we studied last week. The water cycle is the constant movement of water between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere. Okay, it's the recycling of water on our planet. Now here's a picture that you should all have in your notes. It kind of shows all of the different phases of the water cycle. But the ones you need to know are the following. Evaporation, what is it? Who can tell me what is evaporation? Very good. So evaporation is when you have a liquid, in our case water, that changes into a gas. This is a phase change that occurs at the surface of the planet. So that's where you see lakes, rivers, streams, oceans. You have evaporation occurring constantly. Okay, and when this gas turns into, or this liquid turns into a gas, we call that water vapor. Okay, here's your steaming cup of hot water, and you'll see your water vapor escaping in this image, okay? So, condensation is the next one. Who can tell me what is condensation's definition? This is after evaporation, you have condensation way up in the atmosphere where it gets cooler we have it's when our gas now called water vapor for this changes back into a liquid okay it goes from liquid to gas and now from gas to liquid and it becomes water droplets this happens way up in the atmosphere and this is called condensation these are water droplets. Um, the thing about water is it needs something to cling on to. Otherwise, it cannot turn back into a liquid. If you're in a vacuum and you have water vapor, even if you cool the, the vacuum extremely, it will not turn into a uh, water, dro uh, water droplet again unless you have something for it to cling on to. This can be dust, which is what clouds usually form around. Or it can be a surface like this, where the water can cling on to. Okay, then we have precipitation. What is that? Very good. Precipitation occurs after we have lots and lots of water droplets in those clouds. They're moving up and down with different air currents. And they bump into each other, they get bigger and heavier and so precipitation is any form of water that falls to the ground okay so any any bits of water any water vapor that that uh, condenses into water droplets it's when those water droplets fall out of a cloud that's when you get precipitation but it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be just water okay water can take many different forms, or water droplets can take many different forms. What are those other forms? Very good. So we can have snow, crystallized water, due to extremely cold temperatures up at high altitudes. Or we can have hail, frozen bits of water, usually that freeze at a lower part of the atmosphere. Um, and then we have Sleet. Sleet is like a mixture of rain and ice, or rain and hail. It's like a mixture, slushy mixture. And then we have a little skeleton in the ground who says, Please precipitate, I'm thirsty! Alrighty. Teacher Matt gets a little bit bored while he makes these things. They do take a long time to make, so sometimes I add fun characters, like... 
Waterman. All right, he's telling us enough about me. Let's learn about the carbon cycle. All right, guys, so today, carbon cycle, that's what we're talking about. Okay, before we start, does anyone have any idea what the carbon cycle might be? What's the definition out of your own little brains that uh, you think applies to this lesson? Very good. All right, well, the definition I want you to write down in your notes and the same one that's in your books is very simple. The carbon cycle is the constant or ongoing movement of carbon between living organisms and the environment. Okay, this is the recycling of the carbon atom. It's reused. It doesn't get used up and destroyed. It is constantly around. It just changes form. Okay, it has lots of different chemical interactions and it keeps getting used and reused and used and reused. And that's what we're exploring today, the path of the carbon atom. Okay? So, first of all, what is carbon? We know it's an atom, but tell me more. All right, very good. So, carbon is an essential element. As far as we know, it is necessary for life to exist on Earth. That means all organisms that you've ever seen, anything that's alive, including plants, animals, bacteria, all require carbon to exist, okay? Even you are made out of carbon. Okay, quick little quiz. Who can tell me, who can tell me how abundant, how much of this carbon do you think is in our universe, okay? And the way I want you to tell me is, is it the most common element in the universe? Is it the second most common element in the universe? Is it the third most common? Fourth most common? Fifth? Hundredth? Who's got a guess? Okay, so if we're looking throughout the universe to find out what is the most abundant element, we take our, our samples of the entire universe. What are we going to find the most of? Is it going to be carbon or something else? Anybody? Okay, very good. So, you're right. It is the fourth most abundant element in the universe. Very good guess. Okay, that means one out of every four atoms in the universe is a carbon atom. Okay? On average. So, basically, carbon is everywhere in the universe. It makes sense that there's enough carbon on our planet to create uh, life forms, okay? Even though we don't know exactly how that, that started out, without carbon, it would never have been possible. So, another little fun fact for you, it is the second most abundant element in your body, followed by, or preceded by, hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most common element. That's the element... Um, that was also most common in the universe. Hydrogen was the first and lightest element formed. If you look at your periodic table, that's why it's number one. Okay. We got to keep going. We got a lot to cover and not a lot of time. So let's keep moving. What does it look like? What's a carbon atom look like? It looks something like this. This is actually a model, a 3D model. It does not look exactly like this. It does not look like a jack, if you've ever played the game jacks, it does not look exactly like this, but to to perceive it, to understand it, this is a good model that will help you understand what it looks like. So in the middle here, we have carbon. And then we see these four different arms stretching out, okay? And these four arms are the four bonds that this this element tends to make, okay? It has electrons, which can grab onto other electrons of other atoms, and it has four of these free electrons. So these love to grab onto other atoms. In this case, these are representing hydrogen. If carbon is all by itself, it'll grab onto some hydrogen and make methane. Methane is a common gas found in the atmosphere, it is also responsible for global warming along with 
our next our next molecule which is CO2. Can anyone tell me what CO2 stands for? Very good, carbon dioxide. So these are carbon dioxide molecules, okay? Carbon dioxide molecules are a little different than methane because they have double bonds, okay? And instead of bonding to hydrogen, these ones are bonded to, very good, oxygen. Okay, so two oxygen molecules, or two oxygen atoms, rather, are bonded with a double bond to carbon. Okay, so two arms of the carbon are grabbing onto this guy, two arms of the carbon are grabbing onto this guy, and that's all the bonds that it can make. Okay, there's no space to add any other atoms onto this. Okay, so carbon dioxide is found in our atmosphere, and when it's not tied up in living things, it spends most of its time up here. And this is actually a big problem. Normally it wouldn't be, but us humans, ever since our industrialization, ever since our technological improvements that kind of brought us out of the trees, out of the Stone Age, started uh, getting us to make lots and lots of things, we started burning fuels and creating a huge amount of excess CO2 in our atmosphere. For a long time, it didn't really affect much since there's normal fluctuations in CO2, but nowadays we're noticing that there's a lot of excess carbon in the atmosphere, which is acts as a greenhouse gas along with methane, which actually increases the temperature of our global climate. So that means the temperature is increasing and there's all sorts of problems that that um, relates to. And um, we'll get into that more next time, but just keep in mind that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and spends most of its time up in our atmosphere during this cycle. Alrighty, so let's keep on moving. Another big amount of carbon spends most of its, or spends quite a bit of its life, not that it's living, but it spends a lot of its time during the cycle dissolved in water. So water can absorb this uh, diffuse carbon and uh, hold it there for quite a long time. Just as it can be absorbed or diffused into the water, it can diffuse freely out of the water. Okay? Sometimes this carbon will chemically, re uh, chemically react with the water and become carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a big problem because it can alter the acidity of the water. So if this happens in great amounts, huge amounts, like it is currently happening in our oceans and lakes, it can actually alter the acidity of these water ecosystems. This is a huge problem if we're talking about very fragile ecosystems like the Great Barrier Reef. We've noticed in recent times that the increasing acidity of the ocean is causing a huge negative impact on these uh, reef ecosystems. So all the coral and things have a very delicate balance and if that balance is interrupted or disturbed, lots of bad things can happen including coral death and all the species that depend on that coral to survive lose their habitat and that's not good for anybody. All right. We'll talk about that more next time, but let's keep moving on to producers' impact on, the, on this system. What we need to think about is how producers, like this tree, use CO2 during blank. Uh-oh, I forgot a word. Who can help me out? Producers, like this tree, use carbon dioxide during what to make their own food? Anybody? Very good. Okay, we know that producers will take the carbon out of the air and use a little bit of water and some energy from the, very good, from the sun to make their own food using photosynthesis. Okay, so this is a really, really clever way that plants have evolved to break apart this carbon double bond, 
this really strong bond and use the sun's energy to break those bonds and make something they can use namely glucose or their source of food okay all this uh, carbon can be incorporated into their structures and it can also be used to help grow the plant and some of this will be lost when the glucose is broken down during cellular respiration and some of that carbon will escape back into the atmosphere but a good portion of it will be stored in the plant okay so if someone points at a tree and says hey where did most of the material of that tree come from where did all that bark all those leaves where did all that carbon come from did they suck it up from the ground you say no way jose that plant materialized itself out of the air it took carbon out of the air and made that huge structure that's where most of those atoms came from so it's pretty amazing if you think about it that way all right moving on moving on okay so plants producers they don't just make their own structures they make delicious things like apples okay so some of the carbon that's made into these glucoses and sugars can be stored for later as delicious things they can even be producing things like apples that are delicious for other animals to eat why do plants like making delicious things for animals what is the point of that why would a tree make an apple it doesn't make sense if you think about it on the surface level but if you look a little deeper you realize yes very good apples contain seeds the fruit is a way to package those seeds so that something can take that apple and move away from its parent tree and drop those seeds whether it's from excrement or by tossing the apple core after eating it in your lunch onto the ground carelessly creating a whole new life a whole new producer to continue this cycle okay so carbon is being stored in the apple along comes mr gorilla okay mr gorilla's hungry he finds an apple he takes it home to his dwelling with his family of other funny gorillas and they have an apple feast he's eating his apples enjoying himself and guess what he's taking in carbon that carbon that was stored by the producer is being sent into the gorilla's digestive tract and that carbon is now going to be used for his energy for his cellular respiration and to build his own structures okay so he is getting carbon put into his body some of that is being respired some of that is being stored as energy some of that is being made into cellular structures yes I am Mr. Gorilla I'm talking about you but thank you for letting us use you as an example all right Mr. Gorilla some of the carbon is released back to the atmosphere by I just mentioned it but who can tell me what it's there's two words it's a two-word thing exactly cellular respiration all right very good Thank you, Mr. Gorilla. Oh, no! Mr. Gorilla! Unfortunately for Mr. Gorilla, all life must, at some time, come to an end. But when it does, we can still harvest some of that carbon back and get it back into the cycle. Here's how it happens. Some of that carbon will be consumed by what? and some will be released back into the atmosphere as CO2. Who can fill in that blank? Who consumes organisms once they have become deceased? Very good, decomposers. So decomposers, things like fungi, things like earthworms, they can consume Mr gorillas uh, decaying corpse and a lot of that a lot of that uh, carbon can be released some will be eaten by the consumers 
and used for their own structures and their own energy, their own respiration, but some of that carbon will be released as a gas back into the atmosphere. Imagine that. Okay, however, this doesn't, this isn't always the case. Sometimes, like in the situation of the dinosaurs, when we believe they were covered um, probably by a huge amount of debris from an asteroid impact, um, when they're trapped under the ground for a really long time without exposure to oxygen, anaerobic bacteria and other types of decomposers can still break down this tissue, but instead of turning it into gas, there's nowhere for the gas to go, it becomes this stuff. What do you think this black stuff is? It's decaying dinosaur and plant material from really, really long time ago. It can become this black stuff. What is this? Very good. Fossil fuel, okay? This one might be oil, but there's also natural gas and things like that. So, we have fossil fuel in this uh, highly pressurized, oxygenless environment. Millions and millions of years, we get fossil fuel. Of course, this stuff is really important to us, and we do our best to extract it from the earth okay we go down all these layers of the planet just to suck up this delicious gooey stuff okay and this stuff is used by humans for all kinds of energy needs and it has been used like this for a very long time okay so mr oil driller man right here he's thinking mmm dinosaur juice why do you think he calls it dinosaur juice very good, okay? Because these anaerobic bacteria and things like that, these decomposers break down dinosaurs, dead plants, all organic material, and it eventually, inevitably, without oxygen, becomes some form of natural gas. Different pressures, temperatures, and bacterias will make different types of natural gas. Okay? So, these fossil fuels are combusted to release what? Anyone have any idea? Why do we burn these? What's this great what's the greatest thing about this carbon atom? It's really really efficient at creating and releasing energy. Okay? So energy is what it's all about. That's why we burn these fossil fuels in coal plants. It's why we put gas into our car which is refined oil that changes within our uh, combustible engines to release all the energy needed to drive you from home to school and back to home again and wherever your heart desires that is all because of the energy stored in carbon okay so we're releasing that stuff back into the atmosphere as a byproduct because we can't use all of the energy some of that goes back into carbon dioxide. And that energy, or that molecule, goes back into the atmosphere. And this is the big problem. We're, we're releasing too much of this stuff. Too many factories, too much combustion of fossil fuels. And those dinosaurs and, and uh, plants from way long ago, millions, hundreds of millions of years ago, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, all that stuff is a finite resource. Once we use up all that oil, all that natural gas, there's no more coming within our lifetimes. We're gonna have to wait a couple hundred more million years for all of our decaying plant matter, vegetation, and organic uh, things to break down in a similar way. So, we'll talk about that more next time, but that is your overview of the carbon cycle. Does anyone have any immediate questions before we get to a review video? Alright, very good. So, we are going to watch a video and here it goes.
carbon is the basic building block of life, and these unique atoms are found everywhere on Earth. Carbon makes up the Earth's plants and animals, and carbon is also stored in the ocean, the atmosphere, and the crust of the planet. A carbon atom could spend millions of years moving through the Earth in a complex cycle. Understanding the carbon cycle and how it is changing is key to understanding Earth's changing climate. On land, plants remove carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. Animals eat plants and either breathe out carbon or it moves up the food chain. When plants and animals die and decay, they transfer carbon back to the soil. Moving offshore, the ocean holds huge amounts of carbon, about 50 times the amount we find in the atmosphere. The ocean is sometimes called a carbon sink, meaning that it absorbs or takes up carbon from the atmosphere. It takes up carbon through physical and biological processes. At the ocean's surface, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere dissolves into the water. Tiny marine plants called phytoplankton use this carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Phytoplankton are the base of the marine food web. After animals eat the plants, they breathe out the carbon or pass it up the food chain. Sometimes phytoplankton die, decompose, and are recycled in the surface waters. Phytoplankton can also sink to the ocean floor, carrying carbon as they descend. Over long time scales, this process has made the ocean floor the largest reservoir of carbon on the planet. Most of the ocean's nutrients are in cold, deep water. In a process called upwelling, currents bring nutrients and carbon up to the surface. Carbon can then be released as a gas back into the atmosphere, continuing the carbon cycle. By cycling huge amounts of carbon, the ocean helps regulate climate. So when you think of climate, you don't often think of the ocean. You know, climate, you think of, is it going to be hotter this year? Is it going to be colder this year? But the oceans are actually a, a great regulator, a controller of the Earth's climate. And they even are controlling how much carbon is in the atmosphere, which can slow down how quickly climate change is occurring. At the most basic level, the balance between incoming sunlight and outgoing heat determines the Earth's climate. Greenhouse gases act like a blanket and trap heat in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. In the past two centuries, humans have increased atmospheric carbon dioxide by more than 30% by burning fossil fuels and cutting down forests. The Earth has not experienced carbon dioxide levels this high for the past several million years. Researchers are learning that future climate change will depend on carbon levels in the land, in the atmosphere, and in the sea, and how these levels respond to human disturbance. About one-third of all human-generated carbon emissions has dissolved in the ocean. More than 80% of Earth's added heat is now stored in the ocean. In the future, as the planet gets warmer, the water's going to warm up and warm water can hold less carbon than cold water. The other thing is, on a warmer planet, some of the currents are going to slow down, and so we might not be forming as much of this cold, deep water. So we won't be able to transport carbon into the deep sea. So on the whole, the ocean's going to become less effective at removing carbon from the atmosphere. Throughout most of Earth's ocean, the warmer water, weaker circulation, and new temperature gradients that result from climate change will impact marine life and ecosystems. These changes affect the ocean's ability to store carbon. Increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere impacts marine life in other ways. As the ocean absorbs more carbon dioxide, it becomes more acidic, and this can be a threat to some of the organisms that live inside the ocean. As Earth's climate continues to change, how will researchers monitor something as big as the ocean and something as complex as the carbon cycle? NASA Earth observing satellites give scientists the big picture view of our home planet. Varied satellites help researchers detect changes in ocean climate and ecology over time, providing vital insight into the health of our home planet.
Alrighty, guys. So that's our lesson for today. Uh, your homework is going to be to create your own version of the carbon cycle. That means you're going to go through every different step that we talked about, and you can draw it, you can cut out pictures from a magazine, but the most important thing is that you label each step and include all the definitions that we went over today and any more definitions that you might want to add, okay? Now you're going to look at the rubric I pass out and make sure you include all of the different definitions on that rubric and make very clear with arrows going in the direction that the cycle follows, okay? So a lot of these steps can occur in different directions. So if you look once more at this, uh, at this slide, you'll see all the different arrows and how they move throughout the cycle. I want to see a similar thing um, on at our next class, okay? So bring it next class, and I'll check off that you did it, and you'll receive a homework grade um, within a week or so once I get them all. All right? So, guys, um, have a great day. Thanks for coming to class, and I'll see you tomorrow.